uh, moving right into our second panel of the day. This one focused on innovation and, on, and uh, entrepreneurs. We have three amazing entrepreneurs, um, all working in the private sector in different, different forms. Uh, and this session will be moderated by the MD of Kigali Innovation City, Tessie Rusikara. So without any further wait, over <laughs> to Tessie. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our panel. Um, we'll start with, my name is Tessie Rusaga, I'm the Managing Director of Kigali Innovation City. Uh, we'll start with a bit of framing for the discussion before we hand over to our panelists. Um, so, we've heard today about the growth of fintech in Rwanda and how we've seen um, the number of companies in Rwanda triple over the past four years. Uh, we know that there's still a lot of opportunities in different sub-segments. Um, because due to the concentration in payments and in remittances. Um, so today we're joined by a great group of panelists representing both the startup community but also the banking community. Um, these are people who are driving fin innovation in financial services. Uh, I'll start with Olivia Zhang. She's the founder and CEO of Benefactors, um, a factoring company based in Kigali. Um, and then Obina Okwani, who's the Chief Digital Officer of Bank of Kigali. And lastly, we have Steve Shema, who's the founder and CEO of Excess. Um, thank you for, for being here today. And I think to get us started, um, you know, we've talked about talent today, we've talked about um, opportunities and the growth of fintech in, the, in, in Rwanda, but just more broadly in the region on, on the continent. Um, so we're just, just to hear from yourselves, um, you know, starting with Excess and then Olivia, you know, where you see the, the opportunities for fintech, um, either through, based off your entrepreneurial journeys and why you picked the segments that you did. First, huh? <laughs> Olivia? <laughs> sure, <laughs> I can go first. Um, thanks, Tessie. Um, yeah, so the, well, first off, to, to sort of introduce a bit about what, what we do, Benefactors, it's a, it's a factoring company. We provide um, advances on, on invoices, working capital for SMEs um, here in, in, in Rwanda. Uh, we've been operating for three years, um, so had some, had some good traction, some good, uh, some good movement going on. Um, Pre-COVID, obviously now we've been through a, a, an interesting time in, in, in what is essentially a, a lending uh, a company. Um, we've seen uh, the East African fintech scene develop quite quite rapidly in just in the three years that, that we've been we've been active. Um, we started off seeing five years ago um, mostly payments uh, was was the focus on on fintech digitizing payments, uh, mobile money of course everyone knows. Um, but in the last three years, we've seen more and more in business financing, uh, business insights, insure tech, uh, and, and, and so on also coming, uh, coming to the scene. And from, on the one hand, I mean, the, the previous discussions around talent, uh, of course, play, plays a part in, in that. Um, but what we also see is that um, data is, mm. is really the, the, the driver from, at least from in, in our space within actually financing companies, we see that the digitization of things like credit reference bureaus, um, more and more automated integrations um, is really what's driving the fintech, um, say, revolution in, in, in this part of the world. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm also called Shema Steve, and I'm uh, <laughs> Said. I'm a CEO and founder of Exus Limited, and uh, we're behind a digital platform for uh, collective savings schemes. Um, and um, back to your question, what we've seen, at least as far as we're concerned, is uh, we've seen um, a very conducive environment, at least in Rwanda, especially that we're dealing with people at the bottom of the pyramid. Obviously, there have been challenges, you know, over the last, I mean, we've been in operations over the last three to four years now. And uh, yeah, it's been tough, but on top of that, um, it's been easy really to test things because we've been learning uh, and the sector we're operating in it's pretty much new because uh, digitalizing uh, informal savings schemes, uh, it's not easy, especially from the user perspective because first off, they didn't understand uh, people that are used to cash. So it was a bit complicated for them to sort of embrace the digital solutions. But um, maybe one thing I can focus on is when we started, um, even the central bank itself or the government in generally, some of these 
informal savings schemes were not really on the map in terms of them knowing them, you know. And looking at currently, uh, we have a department of the central bank that's now focusing on those groups because what they have understood is if they're to increase the financial inclusion levels, so these are the people, the middle, the people at the bottom of the pyramid, these are the people they need to focus on. And then trying to create um, an environment that allows them to grow organically. So we've seen that happen. And um, the numbers have really uh, grown over the last few months. Uh, surprisingly for us, during COVID, that's when we saw a huge growth. Because at this time, people are not allowed to move. You know, they're not allowed to, to use cash. So those people that were very skeptical when it came to such a kind of solutions, we saw them in breasts. And we, we've, I mean, over the last few months, we've been documenting some of those stories. And um, there's a story of one lady that she, she was pregnant and she needed money. And previously, she had to wait for the group to meet physically to get that money. So through such a kind of solutions, uh, they embraced it, the security of it, the convenience of it. So um, obviously, also to, co to complement what Olivia just said is, there's a whole movement, uh, be it in Rwanda or across the region, of young folks trying to embrace such, such a solutions that mm. sort of solves problems within their communities, as opposed to what I tend to refer to as a copy-paste syndrome. Because mm. these solutions have got to address issues that are happening in our communities, as opposed to things that we've, we've seen somewhere on the internet and try to paste those here. Mm. So that's what I've seen people trying now to move away from that uh, sort of, you know, mindset and then try to first understand what are the needs, what are the pain points of people within our communities and how do you address such a kind of uh, mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. So that's what we've been doing. Um, it's been uh, really going well. We still expect to, to see growth happening there. Mm -hmm. And uh, the government has been quite helpful in terms of, you know, trying to understand where they do not understand the dynamics, they approach us, they engage us, you know, in such a kind of conversation. And where they do, they also sort of treat us as partners and stakeholders, which is something that re that's really appreciated. Yeah. And Shana, how did you narrow down your savings um, as a segment that you were willing that you wanted to tackle? Um, so the way it started, so we were just doing a survey to look at, you know, why the level of financial inclusion and. Um, I mean, the latest stats that I have, you, you're looking at a population of about 11 million in Rwanda and probably less than 3 million active bank accounts. So you wonder the, the difference, what are they using, how are they dealing with financial services? And that's where we came in. And we realized also you, you're looking at 7 million plus people with mobile phones. So our logic was I do not necessarily need to have a form or a conventional bank account. A mobile phone should be enough. So we thought of ourselves as a bridge, you know, to sort of link those people. And we were fascinated by the data because you have millions of people in these informal savings schemes. So the nearest bank is within, what, three hours, four hours working distance? So they perceive banks as things that, are, that do not belong to them. Mm. So they would just come up with their own way of dealing with financial you know, services. So we came in and said, hey, I mean, the big banks, they can't really come down to these people. How about we create a technology that sort of connects them to these people and, and by creating, you know, transparency, security, because they were, you know, keeping money in boxes. So there was a lot of security issues attached to that. Mm -hmm. So we came into the picture because you're looking at people saving as, as small as 200 francs per week. But then you see them grow rapidly, you know, and um, one lady never believed she would borrow 5,000. After 12 months, she had gone to more than, you know, 300,000. That's about $200. So this is, um, that sort of attract, uh, attracted our attention and then we said, this is what we need to do. And we've been doing it and we've been seeing really growth happening. Yeah. Uh, and um, Obina, we know that it's not just the startups that are driving innovation. We've seen um, even the banking sector, specifically BK, you've been on um, a digitization, a digital transformation journey over the last couple of years. Could you talk more about where you, you know, as, as a bank, where you see the opportunities and what you're doing to tap into that op those opportunities from a technology perspective? Yeah, thanks, Tessie. Um, so we have been on a digital transformation journey for the past uh, few years. Um, I, I'd say we see opportunities um, in similar places to where Exist sees it. Um, obviously, you have 
millions of people who are unbanked, uh, no access to um, financial services. Um, not a lot of money to, to be made there, frankly, um, but a lot of good to be, good, good to be had um, mm -hmm. or, or to be done. Um, and you know, should you kind of include a lot of these people uh, in your financial networks, um, there's potential that uh, over time they, they get wealthier and then um, they become a more lucrative customer segment. But then when, when you look at um, the people that we do serve traditionally, government, um, large, large companies, um, there's still so much more value that we can create for them uh, using um, technology. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, we, we get a lot of requests for um, integrations, um, you know, companies who want to uh, have direct uh, API access to their bank account uh, so they can manage and, and kind of execute transactions from mm. their treasury management system or like their ERP, um, which makes their life a lot easier. Um, people who uh, want to reconcile um, transactions, uh, yeah. people who want to reconcile transactions, um, uh, who sell quite a bit using uh, digital transfers, ETC. Um, and it, things still aren't very easy for a lot of these people. Uh, and so uh, a lot of our work is just to make um, the lives of our existing customers uh, that much better and then enable them to do um, things that they couldn't have done before. Mm. Um, if you look at our retail segment, for instance, um, right now, if you're a BK customer, you know you can't manage, get, getting a new card is really difficult, or managing your existing card is really difficult. So, uh, you know, I, I see us uh, creating um, features on our digital platforms that allow you to, to do that. You know, or order, uh, know when your card is expiring, order a new card, have it delivered to your location, um, cancel the card. Um, manage your loans, request new loans, uh, all without um, entering uh, a bank branch, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and all of this can create impact without necessarily even targeting the several millions who are not currently financially included. Um, but we have plans for those people as well. Uh, you know, we work with a lot of uh, large companies, like I said, and um, a, a, many of them are in the agricultural sector. Um, and, and these companies who export or, or who, who process, they have tens of thousands of farmers um, in their, uh, I guess, uh, outgrower schemes, right? And a lot of these people, um, they're not traditionally financially included, right? Mm -hmm. So they get paid in cash, relatively small amounts, fairly frequently. Um, you know, one of the questions that we ask ourselves is how do we bring them in? How do we um, you know, give them access to loans, insurance, uh, how do we increase their productivity um, using um, digital products that, al that allow us to deliver these um, value-added services uh, relatively cheaply mm. um, while still making the lives uh, of the companies who buy from them a lot easier because now you don't have to disburse money in cash. You know, you have digital platforms that allow instant disbursements across you know, wide swaths of, of your farmer's network. Um, you have the data, uh, you know, and there's, there's just so much, so much value that we can create. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and internally, how have you had to, I imagine there's been a lot of internal change as well to make sure the bank is ready to serve these new segments, to introduce these new products, um, a lot of partnership opportunities like you've talked about. Can you walk us through what that journey looks like, even in what the, the key, um, internal transformations have had to be to make sure BK is prepared for this journey? Uh, that's a tough one <laughs> um, <laughs> and a <Okay>. sensitive one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, you know, obviously BK uh, is, is, is the country's oldest bank, yeah. largest bank um, by, you know, by, by quite a bit. Um, there's a lot of legacy and I, I think these transformations, um, that we talk a lot about te technology and processes and new products and innovation and all, and all of that, but really it comes down to the people. Mm. Right? I mean, if, if you're trying to change the way things have been, and th th there are people who are used to the way things are, that is always very difficult. Mm. Um, so, I, I mean, in some ways, so the bank has to grow, and as it grows, you know, it kind of has to get younger, because um, the people who are coming out of school, you know, who have other experiences, they see the world a bit differently, they've mm. had different experiences, they have a different skill set. Um, and, you know, they, 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 they are more likely to bring to the bank what the bank needs um, in its journey to move forward and progress and mm. change. Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, we're hiring a lot more developers now. Y you know, there aren't too many pure engineering uh, organizations in Rwanda. Mm -hmm. You know, you can count them. Exis is one of them. Uh, uh, Assisia, Andela, Irembo, 
um, and, and then BK, mm -hmm. right? I mean, we probably have um, one of the largest groups of engineers and designers in the country, right? And that's, look, that's you know, we intend to continue to grow that um, to fuel our digitization journey. Um, I think Irembo recently localized its platform. It used to, outs it, was, it was outsourced, um, and they, they saw a lot of value in bringing a lot of that in-house. Mm. Um, we also see a lot of value in bringing a lot of those capabilities in-house. Gives us a lot of flexibility, allows us to move closer to the speed of our customers' evolving needs, um, you know, so you're not sending change requests to some, mm. you know, uh, developer farm in some Asian country somewhere. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> instead, uh, you know, you have a team in-house at your HQ. Uh, they can uh, interact directly with the customer, come up with bespoke solutions, uh, deploy quickly, change quickly, um, and, and it really empowers us. Uh, and obviously, because uh, if you bank with us, you know that we still have a long way to go, right? Um, so this is kind of um, how we're thinking about how we're uh, going to get to where uh, we want to be. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, yeah, I like that the recognition that you need a culture change. You also the kind of talent you're hiring um, changes. Um, so maybe to turn to Olivia and Shema, how do you think about the, you know, where you when you need to outsource skills versus building them um, in house? Um, and as a startup, as you grow. Um, where, where's the tipping point where you feel I need to bring this in, um, in house versus um, I, can I can continue to outsource and how should other entrepreneurs who are hearing this discussion really think about that balance? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I'd, perhaps uh, if Shimu will allow, I'll, I'll go first on that one. Um, uh, being a, a non-technical fintech founder myself, yeah. uh, sort of had that very discussion, very sort of uh, close to home. Should we have outsourced? Should we delay uh, our development process, trying to find someone who can do it in-house? You know, what's, what's the right way of doing this? Um, I would always be, I mean, same as, as, as we heard from, from BK, uh, as much as you can do it in-house. Um, you need the control, you need the speed more than anything. Mm -hmm. um, the, the delay and also the, um, the mindset that happens when you need to make a formal request to, to do this, you need to uh, have, have everything designed out up front before you, you send it out uh, to, to an outsource partner compared to when you have a colleague sitting next to you saying, hey, let's, let's, let's just try this thing. Mm -hmm. I have an idea. Let's figure it out. Does it work? Does it not? What does the data say? The kind of innovation and the kind of um, creativity that comes from having that daily interaction with the technical people really allows to the organization as a whole to see the benefit of uh, that, that technology can bring. Because mm -hmm. at, at the end of the day, Technology is a tool. You use it to achieve a certain goal. And you won't know necessarily when you start what's the best way to do it. So uh, you're far better off just trying it out and, and, and uh, you know, looking at what, what does the data tell mm -hmm. you, what is the objective, uh, trying to implement one thing or another, and then iterating and pivoting on that. And that's really hard to do in, in an outsourced uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, model. So from, from, from our perspective, our, our approach was to find a technical person, bring them in-house, who can lead it. Uh, and, and so we've been very lucky with, with the CTO we've been able mm -hmm. to, to bring on board. But it, it did delay us initially, not having the skills. Um, it also allowed us to really understand the, uh, the dynamics at hand and understand the, the challenges and the objectives that our clients were trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. uh, and only deploying technology when we knew what we wanted to do. Um, not trying to put the technology first mm -hmm. and then figuring out what to do with it afterwards. Um, there's so much software out there these days. There's so much technology you can do even without being an engineer. There's plenty of tools that are, um, uh, that, that are able to achieve most of the goals. And even to this day, I still end up doing a lot of the automation uh, in-house, in even though I'm not an engineer and I don't write a single line of code. Because there are these tools that make it easier uh, for non-tech people to, 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 to leverage the benefits of technology. And then you, when you finally get to a point, okay, now we know what we're doing, we've tested it out, we've tried to do it manually, uh, we now are ready to actually invest properly in the software. Mm -hmm. um, that's when you then bring in the engineers and that's when you have them as part of the process of how do we do this properly, how do we do this the best way, how to really get the value out of technology. Um, and, and, and yeah, I, I believe that should be 
by far the most effectively done in-house. So it's on, you started with the fin and then you went to the, then you added the tech yes. when you, were <laughs> you figured Very out the so. fin. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so? I echo what uh, Obi and Oliva just said. I mean, for us, culture has been a big, a big component of what we do. And um, there's something we've been trying. I mean, it's obviously there's a cost to pay, but, uh, but um, so we've been trying to have folks that are working on solution while understanding the impact, the changes that these products have bring about within the communities. And frankly speaking, we've seen um, the motivation of our software engineers change dramatically. So, and that's something we, we, we started out as just, you know, as a, probably a pilot just to see. Because uh, as obviously they said, it's, uh, it was tough to get uh, the talent because you've got a good concept, you know, you've got a good idea. But the moment you put it out, it has to really fulfill the quality requirements. Mm. Now, when you have users starting to, you know, jump into, run into some issues, then it sort of defies the whole reason in the first place. So what we've been doing, because initially you had guys coming in and the demand was super high. So you'd have one guy working for two to three companies at the same time because he knows how to do it. And many people are looking for his services. So what we've had to do is sometimes get these guys away from their machines, go meet the people for whom they're developing the products. And honestly, we've seen a huge change. Mm. So some guys have, have had to leave their previous jobs because they felt an attachment to what they were working on. And I feel like this is something uh, that's really key when it comes to talent because most of these guys have worked for many companies and then at some point they've told you, uh, well, you know what, I'm, I'm no longer into lo running after a paycheck. Now I feel like I want to be a part of something bigger than just myself. So now finding that something that's bigger than, you know, just a paycheck, that's where, you know, that's, that's the key. So what we've been doing is just get some of these guys, some of them, uh, so we have a mixture. We have senior software developers and those that are junior. Mm -hmm. But then what we try to do is just to have those that are far ahead in terms of skills to help the others. But then we first make sure we get the culture aspect right. We get the guys, they know what we're doing. We're not just doing any typical solution. We are building things that are going to make changes, you know, that are going to create an impact within our communities. Some of these guys, they are solving issues from their back, you know, their village back at home. Mm. So that sort of gives them the motivation. So when one, one user calls, you know, and they ha there's that frustration, so it sort of motivates them to do that. So that's what we've been doing, and, and I feel like it's, it's been very gratifying. And um, obviously, there's, there's always that sort of mismatch in terms of sometimes you feel like you want um, 10 or 20 you know, software developers, and then you have BK, you have you have mm -hmm. all these other companies shopping for the same people. So there's that challenge that's still around. But uh, honestly, if you look back three to five years back, the numbers have gone up in terms mm -hmm. of software developers. And now the challenge that I think we have as a players is now to try to see how now we can go down at the, I don't know, university or college level and try to sort of inspire these young folks as they grow up, say, hey, I want to work for, for Exus, I want to work for, for BK Tegals mm -hmm. or BK or Irembo because they feel that connection with the whole reason or the, the, the reason why they're doing what they're doing. And then being a part of something that sort of makes you feel much more, you know, I don't know, confident or, you know, valued in terms of your contribution towards whatever it is you're working on. So that's something I feel like we need to do so that in the next three or five years, we do not run or still face this issue. Because mm -hmm. the demand is still going to go up. I mean, you're going to have other startups coming up. Solutions are still needed. And we need people who understand what they're doing, what they're doing. People who connect with the users, people who connect with the customers. And I think that's something that we need to do. We need to sort of feel that more responsibility. And instead of just hiring somebody for the sake of hiring them, but make sure they understand mm -hmm. why they're doing what they're doing and how they can even improve their skills. You know, because you might have skills today, but yeah. tomorrow you still need to improve them. So how, while at working, how do you even make sure that those people are improving their skills? as opposed to just staying stagnant in terms of skills or what they're, you know, what they're doing. Yeah. So that's what we've been doing. And uh, so far, I mean, as a startup, it's been paying off. Because, uh, I mean, we've, got, we've had guys we wouldn't afford if it wasn't for that. <laughs> you know, when you don't have the money, at least you can sell the story. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> that's what we've been doing. And, and uh, we've been able to convince a few guys, like really good guys in town. And the product, obviously, there are always hiccups here and there. But so far, so good. Mm. Yeah. 
So it sounds like being mission driven, having empathy for the customer yes. is not only um, creating success for you with the customers, but also when it comes to acquiring talent and retaining yes. them. I mean, it's tough. Sometimes you have to hold off a few things just because you need to achieve that, you know, quality or, or whatnot. But the moment you hit it, you know, they understand now they can run by themselves. And then even if tomorrow they go out, you know, talking about what they're doing, because we had that challenge where folks would just work on things, but then you don't see the confidence, you know, the pride in working on what they're working on. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd have people in their hundreds showing, you know, making sure they have to, to watch the Apple events and all of that, like, but that's there. How about stuff we're doing here? Yeah. What, where's the excitement, you know? Why don't you guys get excited? Obviously, they are possibly or arguably far ahead, but we need to develop our own things because we have communities to serve. So there's that sort of you know, component, that conversation that goes on for them to feel like we have to own this up. We have to own this up. However, the skill, I mean, whatever the skills we have, the skill set we have, we can always improve them, but then with a goal in mind. Why mm -hmm. am I improving my skills? Or why am I talking to my friends to learn this and that? So there's that sort of you know, culture. Say, I'm working on this because I know what it's actually delivering to my community back at home. So there's that sort of component, and uh, we still have a long way to go, but um, it's been, you know, good so far. Yeah. yeah. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I just <laughs> had, had one thought to add on, on very much echoing what, what Steve is saying. Um, this, this culture and this mindset, uh, this, this ownership over the, the, the tech development goes beyond, or it has to go beyond the tech team. Mm -hmm. You can't sort of have the... the here's the, the tech guys and here's the rest of the company. Mm. It, it has to sort of that, that mentality of, of let's use data, let's use technology, what it can do, what can we achieve. It has to go across the entire organization. So sort of going back to the question around outsourcing, if you don't have the people next to you as part of the culture, you, you, you end up risking having that separation where technology and digital becomes those guys in that department and we will continue our manual processes here until the big boss tells us that what we to have do. to change. And, and it, that's not the way to drive the, the FinTech yeah. revolution. It has to come from all of the processes that we engage with. It has to come from every user has to feel as though they're part of the journey to digitize and to, to use the tools that are available so that they also start demanding more. So that uh, the, the internal users within the company, within the bank, within the FinTech will be mm -hmm. like, actually, I have this pain point. It's not only our clients that want to achieve something, it's also the internal team that have to feel that, why am I doing this manually? Surely uh, there must be a way to digitize this. Yeah. Or I need this insight, I need this data, I need access to this, that, and the other. And then go and ask the tech guys to, to help mm -hmm. you build that. But the culture has to be the entire organization from the receptionist to, to the, the CTO. Yeah. So maybe to close off on the talent discussion, I want to have a fire round from all three of you. Um, when you look at the market today, you look at the skills that's, that are available, you look at what you need. Um, what are the top three skill sets or job types that you, you think are, um, you, you, at least within your companies, you most require to be able to achieve what you're looking for? So start with Obina and then we can go to Olivia. And yeah, see. thanks. Uh, that's a great question. It's an easy one. Uh, <laughs> engineering mm -hmm. um, uh, of all sorts, front, web, USSD, back, um, test, etc, etc. Um, design, uh, both UX research and UI design, you know, pure artistry, uh, creatives who just love to do um, what they do, um, love to expand. Um, uh, the way they do their work, how they think, what they think about, um, and then uh, product ownership, which is uh, a blend between product ma uh, project management, um, uh, a lot of customer empathy, um, you know, a touch of finance, a touch of business operations. Um, yeah, all three of these things. Um, and there's there's so much junior talent in the market. I, I really feel like. Uh, if we could just have some experts uh, parachute in to collaborate and work with some of our junior guys and help develop them, I, I think that would, that would, that would uh, go a long way. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Olivia and then Steve. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to echo what, what we heard here. <laughs> um, engineering, of course, yeah. from the whole range. Uh, I would say specifically data engineering. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, uh, the, the product owner, product manager role, um, which again is this, this blend across yeah. the business and, and the tech functions. Um, 
and then the um, UX designers in particular. So this is not only looking at the, at the interfaces, but also really understanding how is the customer journey throughout the, mm -hmm. the service. That those will be exactly the same three. Uh, my top three, so the first one would be, I think we need uh, stubborn visionaries. <laughs> just begin with, you know, we need those people that are really stubborn and, you know, that sort of want to get things done. Mm -hmm. uh, so that can go all the way from the executive management all the way down. Uh, secondly, we need good storytellers. So that cuts across, you know, engineering, uh, product designer, marketing, because we need people that tell a good story. So we really need that. I think we really need that as opposed to just doing copy paste, you know. I don't know why I hate this copy paste thing, but I feel like it's too much all over mm. the place, whereby you see one company does that, so another one just comes in and change one thing and then does the same exact yeah. thing. So we need very good storytellers. And obviously, thirdly, we look at engineers now that take all of that and then put into products that can be presented out to the user. Because they have to be that sort of you know, love story cutting across, you know, the users, <laughs> engineers, and for them to sort of feel like they're understood, but also the ones, you know, preparing whatever it is they're preparing, feel like they understand, you know, their audience and their public. So I feel like those three things would really you know. make a good match. Yeah. And I, I hope we can send some of the entrepreneurs to you for storytelling. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> I hope uh, so. So may, to pivot now to, a, you know, the big picture, um, Rwanda wants to be um, obviously a hub for financial services and innovation. Um, so, you know, starting with Obina from the industry pers um, perspective, what do you think can unlock this vision? Um, and then we'll pivot to the entrepreneurs who are also driving this vision. So if you can just repeat the question so that yeah. I answer. Yeah. So Rwanda wants to be a hub for innovation and financial mm -hmm. services. So from your BK's perspective and um, the banking sector, what do you think you can do to drive this vision? Um, and, or what are you doing already? Um, to further unlock this vision. Yeah, man, if I were, if I were an entrepreneur, that would be it would be much easier <laughs> to answer this question. <laughs> I mean, as a bank, what can we do to help Rwanda achieve its goal of becoming a financial hub? Um, gee, that's tough. I mean, well, financial hub involves money. Um, we help people store money. I think if, if we made it a lot easier for money to uh, come in and out of the bank, um, I think a, a lot of people who, who, aren't, uh, who aren't familiar w with Rwanda would be surprised that I think EFT, like electronic funds transfer, is a fairly new thing here. Mm. Um, and because of that, it's still quite nascent. And, and as an industry, we haven't really gotten it right. So there are a lot of errors, a lot of delays, a lot of you know, lost funds. I mean, we're all very familiar with that. Um, and the better we get at that, right, um, the easier it is for someone you know, abroad, they want to domicile here, assuming that we get like, tax and immigration, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, the next thing is bringing the money in that they then want to deploy, right? Instead of uh, having your, the, the funds that you want to invest everywhere else in the world sit, sitting in U UBS, why not mm -hmm. Bank of Kigali? Um, but we have to kind of step up our game. You know, how good are our, our internet banking channels for corporates? Um, how quickly can we send uh, money via SWIFT mm -hmm. or maybe through like a, a, like a cryptocurrency um, uh, funds transfer protocol elsewhere. Um, I think these are the things that we'd have to adopt um, to make it really attractive. Because, I mean, Rwanda is a great place. The story is great. But then it's like, OK, yeah, so I want to you know, get here. I want to bank here. And then all these questions start to yeah. arise. It's like, OK, so I used to bank with UBS or HSBC. And OK, now it's BK. And then there's, there's a clear gap. You know, and, and that will definitely slow down um, some things. So I think we can definitely just improve our services. and. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that, that can help Rwanda get closer to that dream. Yeah. Um, Olivia and Steve? Yeah, um, so, well, <laughs> um, so one thing is, one fact that's clear is the government have been doing a lot in terms of, because I mean, looking at our story is, um, they've been really understanding and the environment is very conducive to try, test, fail, and try again. Mm. So that's already there. For me, I, w I always look back at the private sector. So uh, I think that Obi is here. Hopefully, <laughs> I'm, I'm hoping, finger crossed, that something is done about that. You see a lot of these big you know, banks you know, spending a whole lot of money on, I'd call it, I call it lazy marketing, to be honest. And I'm like, why can't they just 
put aside a small budget for R&D because you've got a lot of fin fintechs around that have good ideas, but they just don't have the money to sort of put it into practice. The banks, they have the money, they have people with the skills that can minimize the risk, and they just need to get these folks in that, are, that have sort of you know, unconventional ideas. And there's a way they can work together in some type of partnerships, you know, whichever way you, want, you might want to structure it. Because mm -hmm. for me, I, I see, I mean, myself starting with me, I've had to work around town, couldn't find people to understand what I'm doing. I tell them you have these groups, you know, in three months time, they're transacting over 30 billion run in France in small savings. No commercial banks in town handles that cash from a retail perspective. But you talk to them, they have other priorities. You see they're spending hundreds of millions on just putting up billboards of products that are you know, already consumed anyways. So for me, I see it from that perspective. The environment is very conducive. We just need you know, those triggering partnerships mm -hmm. from the big guys in the market. The sort of understands um, BK or any other bank, they're not going to be that agile to solve some of these problems that, are, you know, that, are, that the communities are facing. They need to work with the local, the small fintech companies to sort of work together, team up, and then build solutions that add value to both parties. So for me, that's where I see the issue because you can't ask the money, the government. Well, what you could do is get folks from outside around to bring in money, but that's not really good because money ends up going outside again. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at some of these guys that have been in business for what decades to sort of I don't know maybe to minimize the risk to just put a small budget for R&D or testing some of these things you know because for me instead of me sitting in the office just doing the usual thing I can spend a day in a week to get some young folks with fresh ideas coming in you know pitching whichever rings a bell to me then we try it out on a pilot basis and I think that can create the needed momentum to take it from point A to point B. Yeah. And that's where you could see many you know, revolutionary products coming up. If one had an idea and then with the infrastructure that BK has, with the backing, with the money and all of that, they put it together, I think it can create a very delicious sauce <laughs> that everybody can enjoy. So for me, I think, that's, uh, I'm no, sorry to putting you on the spot, no. you know, sorry. I, I think it's a, it's a great segue into corporate um, yeah. startup collaborations exactly. and I, innovations. I think there's so too much potential around there. Maybe we can start with Olivia, because I know you have both the policy background and your startup in terms of what you think needs to be done to unlock more of these partnerships. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we'll hear from Obi what they look for in startups that they, they want to partner with. <laughs> or any advice you have for startups approaching BK? Yeah, sure. Um, the, I mean, it, it's interesting to see that, that someone like BK, for instance, has you know, made a lot of investment in, in trying to be at the forefront of innovation and so on. And, um, but I think where, where there's still some room for improvement sort of at the more uh, policy level, if, if you will, um, is, is looking at, well, what's the, what's the framework for banks collaborating with fintechs? Mm -hmm. um, you, know, what's, you, you mentioned earlier that some APIs towards corporates and so on. Well, what's, what's the regulation around that? Can I, as a fintech, go and access that API? Mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the rules around that? And that's where the regulator comes into play and makes sure that you know, all the various requirements in terms of data privacy, in terms of fraud protection and so on, are, are taken care of. Mm -hmm. So that's an obvious place for the, for the regulator to step in. Um, the secondly, I mean, as, as, as Steve was saying also, we've also found that the, especially the Rwandan Central Bank, which is the one that we deal with the most, has been uh, very accommodating in terms of creating the space for us. So when, when we started three years ago, there was no licensing framework for factoring companies. Mm -hmm. um, we're non-deposit taking credit institution. There was no such license. but. You know, we, we, we developed that together and after a year and a half there was then a new regulation in place and, and, and so on. So seeing that kind of willingness uh, from the regulator to first create the sandboxing environment and then formalize it as we figure out together what's, what's the, the, the necessary regulation um, and necessary protection mm -hmm. um, is, 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 is going to be a huge part of, the, of what's going to drive it um, forward. And then of course at the end of the day um, it's people. I mean, are the leadership and the management of the various banks and, 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 so, and, the, and other key players in, in the institution, are they willing to entertain the idea of partnering with a startup? Yeah. Or is it 
uh, is it a business culture where you have to be a large brand and have raised millions of, of dollars in order to be taken seriously? Mm -hmm. um, what, what, what is it that opens doors? Uh, so having an environment where, whether it's through the, the Kigali Innovation City, having some partnerships where you can, you can help the, 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 the young entrepreneurs get through those doors to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. even if we're not wearing a suit and, 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 and so on, um, so that we can foster those partnerships and, and, and also then showcase them afterwards. Mm. Showcase what's the benefit for the banks, what's the benefit for the regulators, what's the benefit for the wider public. Uh, then I believe ideas will start sort of to take a life of their own, mm. inspiration will go and, and, and so on. But it's, it's going to need a bit of, bit of hand holding to, to get started. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I'm, I'm going to try to uh, say what I'm allowed to say. <laughs> you know, I, I can't make any promises on behalf of the institution, but but I can say this. I'll, I'll tell you in the in the executive suite. I think I think a lot of us are um, quite excited about startups. Mm -hmm. um, I personally have had meetings with a number of local startups and, and startups who are looking to set up shop here. I know our CEO as well um, also has a very uh, you know lively personal interest in these things, and she's also taking the same meetings. Um, I think s startups should invest in understanding the pain points of large companies. Mm. Um, I'll share a few on the BK side. Data, right? Collecting it, um, storing it, organizing it, analyzing it, you know, uh, creating value uh, using the data um, that we have just so much of. Mm. Um, credit scoring, uh, ETC, ETC, that's just one specific pain point that, uh, that, that we have. Um, and, and I think resilience is also needed, right? And, and you also need to have something real, right? It's not enough to come and say, hey, really we like imagine, it. like, what if, if, can you imagine if we could do X, Y, Z with data and give farmers this and, you know, predict X, Y, Z, like, okay, yeah, that's great. So, you know, let's do a demo next week. Mm. Silence, right? <laughs> um, so have something real. Um, <laughs> once you have it, um, I think you need to be resilient because, like Shema said, there are a lot of competing priorities, exactly. right? I mean, these, these, uh, BK is a bank with over a billion uh, USD in, in assets under management. I mean, we serve the government, we serve um, the largest corporate customers. Um, and, and for those of us in the bank, our KPIs are sometimes built around the existing customers, right? There's the incentive to go out. Is it necessarily there, even if the personal excitement is there? So mm. just, just hang in there. If you have something that's of real value that solves a real pain point, I think there's a conversation to be had. Obviously, um, there's no framework at the moment for a bank like, like, like ours investing because it just hasn't been done before. Mm. But there's a global precedent, right? I mean, Goldman Sachs, um, they're investing across the world. I mean, even exactly. a, a place like Nigeria, um, Standard Chartered Bank, um, they, they, they invest uh, as well. You know, mm. I was just reading a story on how they, you know, they invested in uh, you know, a blockchain custody company, right? Which is becoming, which is going to be a key area moving into the future. Mm. Um, and I think as a large organization, or as BK specifically, like when, when we're looking at, you know, I get inundated with pitches, right? And as, mm. as I'm looking at them, I'm thinking to myself, okay, time, money, talents, right? How much time will it take for me to uh, build this myself, mm. right, in-house? Um, how much time will it take for me to choose the right partner given Rwanda's you know, extensive uh, tender, tender laws, right? Find the right partner. After you find the right partner, scope out the problem again. Mm. After you scope it out, do the MVP. Like, that could be six to 12 months. In the same amount of time, could I have hired engineers and built you know, a, a, a rough version of what I'm looking for myself? Um, money, how much is it gonna cost? Uh, you know, someone comes to you with a $2 million price tag. Okay, mm. that's like a whole company. Like, I can just hire people to do this, right? <laughs> For sure. I can hire people from abroad, actually. Mm. Like, I, I'm not limited if that's, the, if that's the amounts. And then the talents. I mean, can I actually find the people who can build these things for me, mm. right? And then when you compare those three points with, um, or th those, those three uh, ideas with real pain points that we have, around data, for instance, um, I think there's a real uh, potential um, for a company to come in and, and offer a service that we might be willing to consume. And, um, you know, and, and I hope, uh, you know, apart from just buying services and, and signing deals with companies that are offering things, mm. um, we could, you know, maybe someday, I, some bank in Rwanda concrete. can take an active role in <laughs> investing. Um, yeah. Well, <laughs> let me start with the startups here, <laughs> if you don't mind. Um, 
I want to slightly disagree with Obi because. Um, mm. You know, we we don't know everything. You know, yeah. all those technical jargons that you know people that have have PhDs and all of that. We don't know those. Mm. You know, some of these things we don't even we never thought about them. So, I mean, telling my story, um, you go around, you set up meetings, but they feel like they expect you to come with everything. Mm. So, if I come with everything, what do I need you? See, that's the question. Because I'm coming because there are things that I have and there are those that I don't have. So what I expect from you is to walk the journey with me. I don't know if I'm making sense there. So mm. this is what happens. So now what happens is you have some startups closing shop because they didn't get any partnership. Mm. Or you have others that managed to get folks from outside. And in the moment you have something, I have banks coming, knocking on their door. It's like, hey, the bus has already left. So this is the issue. So for me, I feel like the bank they should understand that. I mean, if they're spending hundreds of millions in their early budget on marketing or some of these things that are really not bringing in any value in terms of revenues, spending 10 million, because some of, most of these startups in town, they only need what? Just 10 million, 20 million tops. But obviously, understand that they have ideas, there are things we don't know, there are skills we lack, but at least try to walk the journey with us. I know we can, sometimes we can be arrogant. We can think we know everything. I know that, <laughs> I've been there. But there are a few of those startups that sort of, they just want somebody to sort of hold their hands. I've got all these crazy ideas. I don't, I have no clean books. I, I haven't even been keeping my books, you know? Cause that's not my expertise. I just have an idea. So what I need from you is to sort of come in and then we do this together. So there's that sort of, that understanding from these big guys. Because what happens is you knock on their door, nothing happens, and then tomorrow somebody comes from no, God knows where, they've already figured it out, and then they put the bill down there of like five times the amount of money you asked, and then they're like, okay. So, so <laughs> this is, I think, obviously is what we need to do as startups, you know, to sort of clean our mess to some extent. But also the banks and the big companies, they need to understand that we don't know everything. Yeah. There are some of these things. And there's a way you could take calculated risk. Because risk is always part of the equation. They tell you, we don't want to risk anything with you. So I'm looking at calculated risk. So do not take too much risk. Just take calculated risk. But give me a chance. Because this is how you put your foot in the future. Because if you do not give me a chance, because sometimes I can even fail. It's also doable, you know. But at least give me that chance. Do your calculations, you know, minimize the risk. But show me that sign of trust. Give me a chance to prove you right or wrong. If I fail, you kick me out. It's okay. But at least after you've given me a chance. Yeah. And understanding that we need to walk the journey together. Some of these things we don't know. We don't even think they're important. But we just need somebody to come into our journey and try to work together. So for me, that's where I sit, not to say that we are very clean. We've got some issues on our side, but is that lack of, you know, chance, you know? So I so think- It sounds like we, what we need um, mm -hmm. to bridge everything, at least from Olivia's perspective, first mm -hmm. of all, that broader framework mm -hmm. um, that it gives, it gives some structure to these partnerships. Um, and then also from the, you know, the banks and the insurance companies, and I know Obi's taking the heat for the entire financial <laughs> services industry. No point intended. Um, <laughs> is more startups that under actually understand what your challenges are, what your pain mm -hmm. points are, and fixing those. Because a lot of times you find people who are actually competing in the same category where you could do it and you're doing it. Um, so there's no incentive to partner with them. Um, and then uh, when it comes to Steve, we need to get to a point where you understand um, for, the, for, the, for the financial services and the traditional industries, they need to understand the challenges that startups face. They need to be willing to co-create, walk that journey with you. Um, Cut you short. Yeah. Just remind uh, <laughs> the Urubuto story. Ah. That's one of the, I love that story. Because Urubuto is, I think it's owned by BK now. Yeah. It started off by Young Fox. 
They reach out to BK, they understood, they, now they've built something really amazing. Together. Yeah, exactly. So that's just uh, one example. I mean, out of 20, story. you can just get one or exactly. two, but at least get it moving. So that's just my understanding. Not yeah. to take all of them, because you don't have free money to give out. You're a business, so you have to create value for your shareholders. But at the same time, at least try, you know, be intentional about it. So that's one story that we can commend BK, you know, uh, yeah. in terms of you know, them trying to reach out you know, to, this, to the community, you have Urubuto as well, initiative that's ongoing, which has been helping a lot of companies, small, medium companies. So not to say that they haven't been doing anything, but <laughs> no, there's still get... room to do more. That's yeah. my comment. Yeah. If I can take five seconds to respond. Yes. Um, I think these are great points. Uh, I guess two things. One, you know, I mentioned the word framework, and I think that's really important. Um, banks are regulated. And you know, BNR likes us to play within our lane, right? So if we start acting like a venture capital company and investing in startups, um, I think there's a way to do it. But again, it requires a framework, probably setting up a, a subsidiary, and then also engaging um, startups and you know, having capacity building programs so that you know you can teach them how to create a model or tell a story or um, keep their books. That is investment, right? Um, and I think for a market of our size, I think it, there's a lot of philanthropic spirit that would have to come behind that. Not that it doesn't exist, mm -hmm. um, but without the framework, there is, there's, there's hardly a place to even start that conversation. Um, but you know, I, I think there's probably a, a willingness for people to at least start thinking about solutions to, to, uh, to this issue. Um, and like Tessie said, I think um, if, if the companies kind of met us halfway and, and brought uh, solutions um, to problems that we know we have or th that we didn't know we have, I think, at least then we can start discussing. Yeah. Yeah. Great. And I think um, the next part of our session will talk about the FinTech Hub, which you know um, the startups are part of, and what the vision is for the FinTech Hub, which is also trying to at least reduce the, um, the chasm that exists between the corporates and the startups and trying to understand what each of these um, important players needs to drive innovation. Um, so with that, I just want to thank you all for your time. This, I think this was a very good conversation. Um, thank you for your candidness, your candor. Um, and yeah, we'll switch to the next se session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for listening. Thank you.